Today's talk is called Becoming Vegan in Great Health. So I hope you're in the right place. You're lucky if you are. This is a, this is a good one. Uh, I am honored to be introducing someone I've um, become friendly with over the past almost decade now. Uh, Brenda Davis is co-author of eight books, including Becoming Vegan, Defeating Diabetes, Becoming Raw, and The Raw Food Revolution Diet. These are all books that I know I have on my library, and I hope you do too. She is a past chair of the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, which is part of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And Brenda is currently involved in a major diabetes intervention research project in the Marshall Islands where diabetes is rampant. Although if she has anything to do with it, it won't be for long, I'm sure. So please help me welcome Brenda Davis. And uh, thank you for coming. There's so much to do here. It'd be hard to decide what to what to pick. Anyway, uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about becoming vegan in great health. And so this talk is really about how to meet your nutritional requirements. But uh, I'm going to provide you with just a very quick overview. We're going to do an intro. We're going to be talking specifically about protein, iron, calcium, B12, and essential fatty acids. And then I'll give you some practical tips. You know, it's interesting, when I think back 30 years ago, when I was, well, 35 years ago, whatever, when I was in university, when we talked about vegetarian and vegan, do you know that about 5% of vegetarians were vegan? Today, about half of vegetarians are vegan. So it's really changed. More and more people who are becoming vegetarian are actually becoming vegan. And so about 5% of American adults are, ve are a vegetarian and about 2.5% are actually vegan. So, and you know the other thing, 30, 35 years ago, I learned, it's funny actually, it's kind of comical, when I was in, in university, we learned basically one thing about vegetarian diets, they were a little risky, and, and, and we learned one thing about vegan diets, they were downright dangerous. <laughs> and, and that was it. And we actually had a book, we had a textbook that actually one of my professors had written. And, and I was all excited when we were going to learn about vegetarian. And, and it, he had a, a couple of pages on vegetarian diets. And it, it basically said if you're pregnant or lactating or you're a child, or don't even think about it. It was just way too risky. And, and the reason I tell you this is because this is the position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics today on vegetarian and vegan diets. It is the position of the American Dietetic Association that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. While planned vegetarian diets, of course including vegan diets, are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence. And if you come across a health professional who, who actually challenges that, oh, this could be risky for your child or whatever, you, you can print a copy of this document off the internet. This is the official position of one of the most conservative dietetic associations in the world. They didn't come up with this for nothing. This is based on really solid research. Also, this is another document. It's the um, Medical Journal of Australia. They have a, a uh, I actually have it in my bag somewhere, but they had a journal where they did the entire journal on vegetarian nutrition in 2012. So it was really interesting. I co-authored one of the, um, the, the, the papers, which was on essential fatty acid nutrition. And so it's free. It's an open journal. Anybody can download it from the internet. All of the articles on all of the different topics on vegetarian nutrition. So that's kind of interesting too. So in the statement it said there are benefits in the prevention and treatment of chronic diseases. What are they? Well, vegans actually have the lowest body mass index, which is a measure of body fatness of all dietary groups. So, but they're within the healthy range. They generally studies show a BMI of about 21 to 23, which is really quite ideal. It's not underweight, but we're within the healthy weight range, and we're actually one of the very few dietary groups that are within the healthy weight range. 
Uh, vegans also have reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, as do vegetarians, and it's about 28 to 32% lower. Uh, less hypertension, much less hypertension, probably 60 or 70% lower. Much less diabetes, probably about 62% lower in vegans. Um, lower uh, risk of cancers, actually vegetarians, about 8% lower than the general population vegans. The latest study showed 16% lower than the general population. Female cancers were, were about 0.66 or 34% lower than the general population. Uh, gallbladder disease, diverticular disease, even cataracts. Vegans had a 40% reduced risk of cataracts in one study from the UK. So very, very interesting. However, what we're focusing on today is vegan diets are not foolproof. There are a variety of vegan diets. <laughs> As you can see, this little girl is having a 100% vegan snack. <laughs> Coke and potato chips. Really, we need to remember this. You can totally blow it on a vegan diet. You really can. And it's not that hard to do. If you're choosing junk, you're going to blow it. If you're choosing a diet, you know, switching from meat and potato to potatoes to pasta and bagels is not going to support optimal health. Okay, so you really need to think about that. So we're going to talk about the nutrients that often concern people. Protein, iron, calcium, B12, omega-3 fatty acids. So let's start with protein. <laughs> I love this cartoon. This is so great. This little guy down here, is, and this is a bizarro cartoon, is saying to this guy here, no meat at all. Are you, are you sure you're getting enough protein? You know, how many people have heard this particular question a billion times? But look, you know, you look at this guy and you think some of the biggest, strongest animals on the planet, like elephants and big gorillas, are 100% or pretty close to 100% vegan. And they seem to manage to build these muscles without a single drop of meat. Maybe the odd insect and that's about it. So, you know, there's a myth when it comes to meat. And the meat myth is basically that, you know, without meat, you, you really can't get enough protein and you certainly can't get the quality of protein that you need, right? Uh, it, it's just, it doesn't have the kinds of essential amino acids you need. And this is the reality, like every single person on, in, 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 in this particular slide is 100% vegan. And if these guys can build these muscles without meat, I think we can probably amble along reasonably well as well. Okay? So we have two key, key questions here. Number one, can we get enough protein from plants? And number two, can we really get the quality of essential amino acids we need? Or we call them indispensable amino acids. So the quantity question. Can we get enough protein from plants? Well, the first thing we have to ask is how much protein do we actually need? My son, by the way, yes, he's single. <laughs> uh, okay, 10 to 15 percent of calories from protein is what the World Health recommend, uh, recommends, World Health Organization. The RDA, so the Institute of Medicine, recommends 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So for most people, that's about 50 to 70 grams of protein. Vegans, we generally recommend we up protein by 10%. Not necessary if you're eating a lot of soy foods because of the quality and absorbability of the protein from tofu and soy milk. You don't really need to do that if you're eating a lot of those foods. But if you're not eating a lot of soy foods, then increasing your intake by 10%, it's not because it's inferior quality, it's because it, we don't digest the, the, the uh, protein from plants quite as efficiently. So it's more of it will be lost in our stool. So that's the only reason. So we up it by 10% to compensate for what we lose in the stool. And needs are higher for children per, gram, uh, per kilogram of body weight. Oh, one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. I'm Canadian, so I know these things. <laughs> but I know you guys have not switched yet. You will, you will. 
and they're higher for athletes as well. As a matter of fact, athletes probably need about 1.2 to 1.7 if they're really serious endurance athletes or strength training athletes. And the reason is simple, they're, they need a lot of calories, and so it, it increases the total amount of protein that they need for all of their activities. The average vegan gets 11 to 14% of calories from protein, which is bang on what the World Health Organization recommends, so it's not a huge deal. If you, if you, um, actually I'm going to remove, is it okay if I remove my jacket? So, do that. Um, if, if you actually look at the amount of protein in a various plant foods, you can see why it's not that difficult to get 10 to 15 percent of calories from protein. So here, meat, poultry, eggs, you can see all they are really is protein and fat, right? So the percent of calories from protein depends on how much fat is there. If there's hardly any fat, very high protein. If there's a lot of fat, like in most meat, we're looking 40 to 60 percent at least calories from fat, so the rest would be protein. But if you look at, at veggie meats, we see lots of them out in the exhibit hall, 55 to 85 percent calories from protein. Non-starchy vegetables and legumes are somewhere usually 15, 20 to 40 percent of calories from protein. How many people knew that mushrooms were 30 percent of calories from protein? Spinach is 39 percent of calories from protein. Broccoli is, you know, 36, 37% of calories from protein. People don't realize that, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Grains, nuts, and seeds are about 8 to 17% of calories from protein. The only things that sort of fall below the 10% the level are root vegetables, which can be 7 to 12%, to and fruits, which are about 2 to 10% of calories from protein. So, hamburger, 39% of calories from protein. One patty has 22 grams of protein. Spinach, 39% of calories from protein. But guess what? You need to eat 24 cups. <laughs> and, and, and this, I tell you this because I don't want you to think that you eat a half cup of spinach and it equals your protein for the day. It doesn't, okay? So, so but the, you know what? You, the take home message is here. You eat like a horse or a cow and you go, good. Right? So though there are species that do get plenty of calories, which most of us don't, but still these foods can be contributors. So if you're cooking spinach, sometimes you'll eat a, a full cup and, and or you'll eat uh, you know huge salad or you put it in, in your smoothie. It does contribute to your protein needs and it's actually reasonable quality protein. But now let's compare the hamburger to tofu. Tofu is actually 41% of calories from protein. About a half a cup or 0.55 cup of tofu is 22 grams of protein, same as one hamburger patty. So there are some foods that are very concentrated in protein within the plant kingdom. For just 15 grams of protein, and most people would need about four of these per day to meet their protein requirements. Bigger men would, would need more. But you can get 15 grams of protein from a cup of beans, from a pound of broccoli, a veggie burger, and we're just talking about the patty, really. Um, a a three-eighths of a cup of tofu, a peanut butter sandwich, three-eighths of a cup of pumpkin seeds, two cups of quinoa. So you can see that it, there, you get bits of protein in pretty much every, everything that you eat. There are really two, two ways of blowing it, and one is by eating insufficient calories. How many people have a problem with eating insufficient calories? <laughs> yeah, right. You see, not, not many, not too many people really do have a hard time finding enough food to eat in, in North America anyway. So the reasons might be poverty, chronic under-eating, so some, uh, someone who has an eating disorder, someone who's sick might not get enough calories. So if you don't get enough calories, you might, you might not get enough protein either. Uh, the second is eating mostly junk food. Uh, or eating mostly foods that are very, very high in sugar and very low, very, very low in protein. And we see junk food diets can fall into this category, and sometimes even fruitarian diets, because fruits are very low in protein, can actually be inadequate in protein. Or just very poorly designed raw diets. Raw diets can provide enough protein, but they need to be well designed. So the second question was about quality. Can we get all of the indispensable amino acids that we need from plants? And the answer is absolutely, yes we can. There are nine indispensable amino acids 
that um, our bodies can't make. We've got to get them from our foods. Guess what? Animals don't make any of them. That's why they're indispensable. They're made by plants, every single one. It makes no sense at all to think we can't get them from plants. It's where they come from. So, you know, bottom line really is we get them directly by eating plants or we get them directly, indirectly, by eating animals that ate plants or by eating animals that ate other animals that ate plants. Okay? So, but somewhere along the food chain, they came from plants. So, of course, we can get them from plants, but people say, but isn't plant protein inferior? And the answer is not at all. All plant foods contain all nine of these indispensable amino acids. However, in some plants, one or more of those amino acids is in a little bit short quantity. So, say, if all you ate was one food, so rice, for example, that's all you ever eat, uh, then you might not get enough lysine because it's low in lysine. Uh, however, if you ate enough rice, you, you could still get enough lysine because lysine is still there. But very few people live on one, one food. We live on a variety of foods. So do we actually have to combine our proteins? Do we have to eat beans with our rice? Do we have to eat peanut butter with our bread? And actually the answer is not at all. Plants all contribute amino acids and we actually store any excesses in these pools in our bodies and call protein pools. So let's say all you eat is um, beans, so a lentil soup at lunch and you get a little extra lysine, gets stored in your pools and all you have is piece of toast for dinner. You need extra lysine, it gets drawn from your pools. So we've known this for 20 years. This is an old wives' tale that continues to linger. You do not have to consciously complement proteins. All you have to do is eat enough calories, eat a variety of foods, and include reasonable sources of protein. Now, throughout the life cycle, in infancy and childhood, the amino acid that we have to worry about most is lysine. It's really important during the growing years and during pregnancy and lactation. And lysine is most concentrated in legumes and soy products. So these are especially important during these times of life. Now, legumes are rich, rice and wheat are very low in lysine. And during adulthood, tryptophan is actually the limiting amino acid for adults. And you know what? We didn't know this five years ago. So this is really quite new. This came out of the 2012 Global Protein Conference from some of the world's leading experts. Legumes are rich in tryptophan, wheat provides moderate amounts, and corn and maize are very low. So in countries where corn and maize are you know, the primary staples, they really need to be concerned about making sure they include beans in their diet as well. So practical pointers, eat sufficient calories, get a variety of plant foods, include legumes or legume-based foods on a daily basis, and limit your intake of foods that are really rich in fat and sugar. So moving on to iron. <laughs> you know, iron is interesting because we know, right, meat is a rich source of iron. People wonder, well, where do vegans get uh, their iron? But the, the truth is, is that most vegetarians and vegans actually have adequate iron uh, intake and adequate iron status, which is really quite interesting. Vegan intakes are higher than any other dietary group. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that. But, but vegans actually consume more iron than, than lacto-ovo vegetarians or non-vegetarians. And the reason is really simple. Milk is a really poor source of iron. And when you have about a third of your calories coming from dairy products, you're not getting a lot of iron in, the, in, in those calories. And so when you eat vegan, you're getting iron from almost everything you eat. Because there's little bits of it in everything. So vegan, vegetarians and vegans tend to, however, have lower iron stores. Okay, so we have lower serum ferritin, we just have lower iron stores. However, it appears as though this may actually be an advantage because people who have high iron stores, these high iron stores are linked to insulin resistance, diabetes, heart disease, and even some forms of cancer. Their iron, free iron in your blood acts as a pro-oxidant. And so this is not necessarily a good thing. So now the thinking is vegans and vegetarians are probably actually quite protected because of their lower iron stores. 
Uh, recommended iron intakes. Well, you know what the, uh, the this, this is interesting too. It's recommended that that, that vegans get 1.8 times and vegetarians a higher intakes of iron than non-vegetarians. And so the RDA is 18 milligrams for women. It's 32.4 milligrams for vegetarians and vegans, and for men it's 8 milligrams and 14.4 for vegetarians and vegans. And you're not going to believe this when I tell you this, but this figure is actually really controversial in the nutrition world because these figures were based on a test diet that was the worst test diet you can imagine. It was a diet that they loaded with inhibitors of iron absorption. So all the phytates and all the things that inhibit iron absorption. And then they, they made it really low in the things that enhance iron absorption. And they so they took the worst case scenario and based the recommendations for vegetarians and vegans on the worst case scenario, which is really quite ridiculous because we eat double or triple the amount of vitamin C that other people do. And we don't, you know, our intake of phytates is usually quite moderate. And, and so, they, you know, most most experts in the vegan nutrition world do not believe we need to be consuming those quantities of iron. I think we may need a little bit more than the, the RDA, but probably somewhere between this and this. Maybe 20, 25 grams would be, or milligrams, sorry, would be reasonable. So what's the deal about heme and non-heme iron? Do you know what the word heme iron means? It's in blood iron. Heme is blood. So, so in meat, you have iron from, from blood. And, and the iron, the heme iron, is only in meat. It's not in anything else. 50 to 60% of the iron in meat is, is in the heme form. The rest is in the non-heme form. It is 15 to 35% bioavailable. So it is very rapidly absorbed into your bloodstream. Non-heme iron is in both plants and meat. It's only 2 to 20% bioavailable. However, this is the interesting thing. We've had very recent research, 2012 research, that has shown that there is a type of iron in some foods, in some legumes, and so on, which is called ferritin. And, and what happens is it's in this molecule that is absorbed across the intestinal barrier, and it's got like a thousand atoms of iron within this molecule, and they're released as you need them. So they're slowly released, and you don't get this iron sort of overload, and iron ends up being a pro-oxidant and getting oxidized. It's very protective. And as a matter of fact, the people that wrote this, this was Thiel in 2012, they basically ended the paper saying that this gives us real hope that we can provide the world with sufficient iron. Iron is the number one nutritional deficiency worldwide by feeding people legumes. What a concept. So it's really quite quite uh, uh, interesting research. So the other thing to know is that foods that are rich in vitamin C and organic acids like the foods here increase iron absorption by about two to six times. So they can, it can actually help to increase iron absorption to the level that you would absorb iron from heme iron sources. This is kind of weird, but you can actually use cast iron to increase the iron content of foods. You can, it, 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 up to 16 times actually, and yes, you're eating the frying pan and you're getting the iron from the frying pan, especially if you're cooking something acidic in the frying pan, but actually that the form of iron is, is totally usable by the human body. So. It can, if you're, you know, if you're deficient in iron, it can be a way of boosting your levels. So there are major inhibitors of iron absorption. Number one, phytates. In phytates, do you know where phytates are really concentrated? Wheat bran. It's like a little phytate bomb. It's the most concentrated source of, of, of phytates in the diet. But it can actually inhibit iron absorption by up to 90%. And uh, some of it can be counteracted with vitamin C. And the thing to know is that if you're vegan, you do not need to be sprinkling all of your food with wheat bran. To be honest, you shouldn't really be sprinkling any of your food with wheat bran. You don't need the extra phytates. They inhibit iron absorption, zinc absorption, uh, calcium absorption. So you really don't need to be doing that. You already eat two or three times the fiber that the you know non-vegetarian or vegan would be eating. Your fiber intakes are good. 
You don't need to sprinkle bran on. As a matter of fact, I dealt with a one gentleman who was in his 80s and he was having some health challenges as a vegan. As soon as he cut the bran out, his health challenges disappeared, his mineral status improved, and he started doing a lot better. So just, just know that it's a little, little uh, tip that I think is useful. You can reduce phytates by leavening, sprouting, fermenting, soaking, roasting. There's a lot to learn by raw food preparation, that the sprouting, the soaking, the fermenting, we really enhance nutrient absorption when we prepare foods in those ways. And, and it just in, we not only enhance the absorption of the nutrients and reduce the anti-nutrients, we actually improve the nutrients. The, the protein profile changes, lysine increases. It's amazing what happens when a plant gets ready to produce, you know, to prepare itself for the growth of a new plant. You you soak and sprout a wheat berry and you've increased phytochemicals 400 percent Okay, so it's just really interesting to know. The other thing that inhibits iron absorption is uh, polyphenolic compounds like tannins in tea. And so they may reduce iron absorption by 50 to 90 percent. The most they're most concentrated in uh, black and green tea. There are lesser amounts in coffee, herbal teas, like even peppermint and chamomile tea, uh, cocoa, wine, so all of these things. So if you're a real tea drinker, you might want to separate your tea drinking from your meal if you, if you are low in iron or struggle with your iron uh, status. Um, so, and vitamin C and organic acids can help to offset that as well. And what you want to do is make sure that within your choices that you're making every day, you're including lots of iron-rich foods. So legumes are really concentrated in iron. Soybeans, tofu, lentils, black beans, all of these, lima beans, chickpeas. The ones I've listed actually top the list in, in iron content. Whole grains, it's actually mostly the pseudo-grains that are really high, like amaranth and quinoa. And then the true amaranth and quinoa aren't true grass grains. They're more seeds, and so they're a little different than, than other grains. But iron, and of course, iron fortified grains. Uh, seeds are all, pumpkin seeds are unbelievably, they're just unbelievably nutrient dense. They're loaded with protein, they're loaded with iron and zinc, and they, they really can help resolve some of these issues if you include them on a regular basis. But cashews, pine nuts, almonds, and Brazil nuts are all quite high in iron. Uh, mushrooms. Mushrooms are, you know, people think mushrooms are just this watery, not much to them. But they are really high in B vitamins. They're quite high in protein. And they're actually really high in iron as well, relative to a lot of other vegetables. Peas, string beans, green leafy vegetables are all fairly high in iron. And in the fruit world, of course, we know it's the dried fruits and the prune juice and so forth that are good sources. Other foods, iron fortified meat analogs and blackstrap molasses. Blackstrap molasses is really the only sugar that has a, quite a lot of minerals. And so one or two tablespoons of blackstrap molasses will give you about as much uh, iron as an eight ounce steak. <laughs> and about as much calcium as, as a cup of milk. So it's really quite shocking for that small amount. So just adding it to muffins or, or squares or something like that. Calcium. You know, in our culture, we kind of view the slogan, got milk, as being synonymous with got bones. It's just, people think that it's impossible to have a healthy skeleton if you're not drinking a ton of cow's milk. And so we want to really look at that. And, and I remember my son, when he was young, somebody told him that if he didn't drink milk, he would just be a puddle of blood and skin on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we really do have, have these thoughts. Uh, and, and I mean, for good reason. The, the, the dairy industry has done a phenomenal job of educating the mass population about the need for dairy products. They've spent a lot of money on it. So the big question is, are the relative differences in dairy intake reflective of bone health in lacto-ovo vegan and raw vegetarians? So well, compared to the fracture, we actually, this is the only study I know of that's 
really looked at calcium intakes and fracture risk in meat eaters, fish eaters, lacto ovo vegetarians, and vegans. And what they found is that the risk was about the same in meat eaters, fish eaters, lacto ovo vegetarians, but in vegans, they had a 30% increase in fracture risk. Great. Yeah. So that, that's a little concerning. However, the difference completely disappeared in vegans who were consuming more than 525 milligrams of calcium a day. So those who were eating a little bit more calcium had no greater risk at all. So that's, that's interesting to know. Most vegans, however, about 45% of them had intakes less than 525. About 76% had intakes less than 700 milligrams a day. So what do we do? So let's look at other studies. We've got 14 studies that actually have assessed bone mineral density in vegans. Eight reported uh, reduced uh, indicators of bone health among vegans compared to lacto ovo and vegetarians. The bone mineral density uh, of vegans was actually 10 to 20% lower than those of lacto ovo vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Six studies found little difference in the bone health of vegans compared to other dietary groups. Three studies assessed fracture rates and risk. One showed increased fracture rates in vegans. One showed increased fracture risk and one found no difference at all. So the conclusions of the authors were simple. lacto ovo vegetarians have similar bone health to non-vegetarians. Vegans have lower bone density when their calcium intake is low. Vegans need to be consuming at least 525 <coughs> milligrams of calcium a day and preferably meet the RDA for calcium to ensure they have strong bones. And you know, I'm showing this, this, I'm showing, this is my show off picture. This is me. I am 54 years old. Um, I, uh, oh well, so it's, it's no big deal, but just, just to say, I'm postmenopausal, have been for a couple of years. I have been vegan for 25 years plus, and I have a very strong family history of osteoporosis. So my doctor said, we need to get your bone density done. And guess what? My bone lumbar spine was 1.44 grams per centimeter squared, which is two and a half standard deviations above expected. They could not plot it on the graph. They just had an arrow on the top. My uh, bone mineral density of my right femur was almost two standard deviations above expected for my age. And the doctor's jaw dropped when he looked at my results. He said, your bones are made of steel. This is unbelievable. He said, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. And the reason I tell you that is I just told you about all of these vegans that have you know, lower bone density and higher rates when they're not consuming enough calcium and so forth. I'm really careful about my diet and I exercise. Exercise is a way of saying to your bones, stay strong. We need you to be strong. You know, and so it's a constant, constant indication that you stay strong. And so I exercise regularly, and I do. I make sure I get enough vitamin D. I get, make sure I get enough uh, calcium and all of the other nutrients that are needed. So how much calcium do we need? Well, the RDA is a thousand milligrams for for people up to 65 years of age, and then it goes up to 1,200 after that. So for most people, that's a fair bit of calcium to get. But what I, what I do want to tell you is that people in Paleolithic times ate about 2,000 milligrams of calcium a day without a drop of milk, okay? Milk is, you know, do we really need milk to get enough calcium? Well, it provides 300 milligrams per cup. So you drink three cups and you're there, basically. But it's not the only source of calcium, nor is it necessarily the best source of calcium for people. Think about it. You know, we really think about this. Would it make any sense for human beings to require moose milk, deer milk, dog milk, cat milk, bear milk, cow milk for their survival? Of course not. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Humans have no requirement for cow's milk whatsoever. Sure. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Look at moose milk. Moose milk actually has twice the calcium content of uh, cow's milk. Do we say it's a required food? No. So it's just kind of silliness. You know, Walter Willett, he is a, a professor of medicine 
and the head of um, epidemiology at, uh, at Harvard University. And he's the one, you know, the nurses' health study, the health professional studies, all of these studies he's in, very involved with. And he's really considered one of the world leading experts uh, on nutritional epidemiology. And he, so uh, quite an interesting character. But, but he basically said, if no one really knows the best daily calcium target, then why not play it safe and boost your calcium intake by drinking three glasses of milk a day? Well, here are five good reasons. Lactose intolerance, saturated fat, extra calories, a possible risk of prostate cancer, and a possible risk of, in, of ovarian cancer. So, good reasons, I think, but it's, not, it's interesting coming from someone like that. So, can we get calcium from plants? Of course. And as I mentioned, as they did in you know, early days, uh, calcium-rich plant foods have so many advantages over uh, dairy products. They're rich in other things that we need to build our bones, like vitamin C, K, vitamin K is hugely important for bone health, and folate, magnesium, potassium, boron, very important to bone health. They're loaded with antioxidants and phytochemicals that help with bone health. They're cholesterol-free, they're low in fat, low in saturated fat. Calcium-rich plant foods, we just don't learn about them in school, right? We learn about cow's milk for bone health. So we need to familiarize ourselves with good sources of calcium, like the leafy greens that are low in oxalic acid. I'll tell you more about that. Nuts and seeds and beans and figs and molasses and uh, fortified products like the non-dairy beverages and tofu that's made with calcium, all excellent sources of calcium. So people say, but is it bioavailable? We've heard it's not bioavailable. And in fact, if you look, we absorb about 32% of the calcium from dairy products. We absorb about the same from tofu. We absorb just a little bit less from legumes and soy milk, probably about 25% of the calcium. We absorb more from the low oxalate leafy greens, like broccoli, kale, Chinese greens. We absorb over 40% of the calcium, actually about 40 to 70% of the calcium from these foods. Compared to spinach, beet greens, and Swiss chard, which are high in oxalic acid, we don't absorb a lot of calcium from those foods. So why the oxalates bind to the calcium, making them unavailable. We just can't break those complexes down. So a lot of people say to me this, well, what if I have kale and spinach in my salad? You know, will the spinach prevent me from absorbing the calcium from the kale? And the answer is absolutely not. You actually still absorb some of the calcium from the spinach. You absorb maybe 5 or 10% of it. Spinach is loaded with calcium. You absorb some, it doesn't affect the absorption from the kale at all. So it's not that these foods are bad. These are wonderful foods. It's just don't rely on them as big sources of calcium, even though on the charts they're quite high. <coughs> know your calcium allies. The key vitamins, especially vitamin K and vitamin D, very important for bone health. Key minerals, potassium, magnesium. Do you know when uh, my writing partner and I were doing the last Becoming Vegan, which just was released, by the way, we actually had a hard time getting potassium levels to where they need to be without including a lot of fruit in the diet. And it's interesting, even on a vegan diet, when you're eating a ton of fruits and vegetables, potassium, it tends to be low. We really need to be eating a lot of these foods. Soy products, the isoflavones may be somewhat protective. Fruits and vegetables are very protective to bone health. And shockingly, we need sufficient protein. A lot of people always thought, keep protein as low as possible for bones because it causes you to urinate out uh, calcium. And I'll tell you more about that, but in fact, we need to make sure we get sufficient protein for bone health. We need to be aware of calcium thieves, like inadequate vitamin D, the oxalates in, in uh, these foods, phytates, excessive preformed vitamin A. And so anything over 5,000 IUs in supplements is not a good idea. It has adverse effects on bone health. Excessive alcohol intake and even caffeine can have negative impacts on bone health. The, thing, the biggies are sodium. When you eat a lot of sodium, it causes you to pee out calcium. 
So it's really important not to overdo sodium if you have issues there. Diets with a very high metabolic acid load, so that's usually meat-heavy processed food diets, cause you to urinate out a lot of calcium. And excessive protein, too much protein can be an issue. But, you know, protein actually has a bit of a contradictory relationship with bone health. On the one hand, it has metabolic activities that are detrimental to bone health, like the protein actually does increase urinary losses of calcium, and it increases uh, metabolic acid load, stimulating um, bone breakdown. On the other hand, metabol it has metabolic activities supportive to bone health. It increases calcium absorption, and it enhances bone building activities. It also provides structural material for building bones. Bones are made of protein and calcium and all sorts of uh, good things, but we need to recognize that we need enough protein. And this study actually looked at peri- and postmenopausal vegetarian women, and um, almost 2,000 of them, and found that vegetarians with the lowest intakes of vegetable protein were at the highest risk of wrist fractures. Uh, vegetarians eating the most vegetable protein, at least a serving a day, had 68% fewer fractures. And uh, what they were talking about was, you know, the vegetable protein foods were beans and soy products, nuts and meat analogs were all protective of, of bones in this study. So just something to bear in mind. So how do we maximize bone health? Well, in terms of diet, we want to try to meet the recommended intakes for calcium, load up on the good nutrients that are important for, for bone building, but we also want to get plenty of exercise and to me, what is plenty of exercise? It's about an hour, five or six times a week. And so I know people say, wow, that's a lot of exercise, but it's not really for humans. When you think about our past, and we should be active, and we're sitting at a desk all day, a lot of us, if we're not in physically active jobs, we actually have to physically do some decent exercise. And there should be a mixture in, in our exercise of cardiovascular flexibility and strength exercises. So it's really important. I know myself, for example, I'll do two, you know, I'll, I'll go for a run and I'll do a yoga class or I'll do, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to do some cardio and either strength or flexibility every single day, seven days a week, normally. Uh, when I travel, it may be a little bit less, but I think that's really helped to protect my bones. So, uh, vitamin B12. Many vegans believe that we should be able to obtain all of our nutrients naturally, including B12. But we have to face the truth. Plants are not reliable B12 sources. Seaweed contains a mixture of vitamin B and B12 analogs. And these analogs look like B12, they attach to B12 receptor sites, and they block real B12 from getting on to the receptor sites. And they can actually contribute to a functional B12 deficiency. So we need to be a little bit careful of that. There are some that look promising, like chlorella may have some usable B12, but until we, and AFA is a blue type of blue-green algae, but at this point we can't rely on them. Uh, for B, as B12 sources. Fermented foods do not rely on them. There are some countries like Indonesia, make, they make tempeh that is a reasonable source of B12, but they, do it, they don't do it in sanitary stainless steel vats like we would do. So it, with the level of sanitation, we can't rely on those foods for B12. Organic vegetables as well, unless they're grown on night soil, which is human manure or something like that, we really can't rely on them uh, for B12. And if we are relying on organic foods for B12, they may also be sources of pathogenic bacteria. So we just can't do that. Uh, internal production is rarely sufficient. We, we do produce um, a little bit of, B well, we produce a lot of B12 in the large intestine. Unfortunately, it gets absorbed in the small intestine and things don't usually go backwards. You know, it goes out the door, right? So, so that's the problem. You know, and, and we, do absorb, we do make a little bit in our small intestine, a little bit in our stomach. We make some in our oral cavity, but it's not usually enough to meet daily needs. And if it is enough in your oral cavity to meet daily needs, you probably don't have any friends. <laughs> You're, you know, you would have to have a lot of dental plaque, and it's bad. I mean, you would have really stinky breath, probably. 
So not, you know, not the way to meet your B12 requirements. Now, vitamin B12 stores, it, vitamin B12 is extraordinarily efficiently recycled. Stores can last probably two, three years or longer in adults without any sort of obvious sources. Uh, although some people become deficient within six months, and I've seen that myself. Breastfed babies born to B12 deficient mothers, they are in trouble in very short order. And just know that. Uh, they can have clinical signs of deficiency within weeks of birth. Within months of birth, they can have irreversible brain damage. Okay, because B12 is absolutely critical to your nervous, to your central nervous system. And it's not something to, to fool around with. So if you look at B12 status of vegans, both intakes and status are slightly below that of the general population. Vegans and, and raw vegans, even lower. So we, you know, Vegans who take B12 supplements or eat B12 fortified foods actually usually have really good status. Uh, but the average serum, serum uh, B12 in, in vegans tends to be around, around 120 to 160 uh, picograms per meal. It should be at least 400. So we need to get our act together uh, where B12 is concerned. The first sign of, of deficiency is usually uh, weakness, fatigue, irritability, and then this nerve damage. And, and what you get is tingling at the, in the ends of your fingers and sometimes your toes and even sometimes the tip of your nose. So if you've got tingling in your fingers, you, you really need to get your B12 uh, status checked. Uh, gastrointestinal disturbances, elevated homocysteine, which increases your risk of heart disease. So these are not good things. We need to keep our B12 levels in check. Uh, you know what? B12, if you're a really responsible vegan, you may actually be at an advantage over non-vegans in the long term because if you are in the habit of taking B12, 1,000 micrograms, a couple times a week, whatever, uh, it, it, during your senior years, 10 to 30 percent of people over 50 years of age don't cleave B12 off the, the uh, protein it's bound to in animal foods. And, and so they end up with B12 deficiency and dementia because of B12 deficiency. The only B12 they should be taking is the same as what we should be taking, fortified foods and supplements, because that's the B12 you can rely on. You can't rely on B12 from animal products if you're over 50. So, and, and so, in fact, vegans may be at a bit of an advantage that way. The bottom line is just don't mess with B12. Include reliable sources, and they are for vegetarian, or for vegans and lacto-ovo vegetarians, supplements and fortified foods. Lacto-ovo vegetarians who are, who are under 50 can rely on dairy products and eggs as well. But how much is enough? Well, the RDA of 2.4 micrograms a day is probably not enough to keep homocysteine down. We need at least four micrograms per day from fortified foods in two or more meals. And 25 to 250 micrograms per day from supplements at least 1,000 micrograms two to three times per week from supplements. So that's where you need to go. There are lots of foods that are fortified with B12, and I can see my time is starting to run out, so I'm gonna zip through omega-3s. A lot of people wonder where we get uh, our omega-3s if we're not eating fish. And we can get enough omega-3s without fish. Plant, plants do contain omega-3s, and we have the ability to change those into the sort of fish oils in our bodies. Although this isn't very um, e efficient, the conversion is not very efficient. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Vegans generally in their blood, tissue, and breast milk, they have about a third to a half the levels of DHA and EPA. These are the fish fats uh, compared to the general population. So why are our omega-3s low? Well, vegan diets often don't con contain sufficient omega-3s and they generally don't contain any EPA and DHA, which, as I mentioned, come mainly from fish in most people's diets. So we need to optimize conversion of the plant omega-3 to these big, long-chain omega-3s. So how do we do that? Number one, we need to balance omega-6 and omega-3. The ratio of 2 to 1 to 4 to 1 is probably ideal. It's not that important for people eating fish. It's much more important for eating people who are vegan. So I'm sorry I don't have time to go into this too much, but let me just tell you, 
that, that the recommendations for fish eaters are not the same as the recommendations for vegans. We need to double the RDA for alpha linolenic acid, okay? Which means we need about 2.2 grams per day for women and 3.2 grams per day for men. And we can also consider an EPA or DHA supplement. And you'd say, well, we don't, we won't, we don't want to eat fish oil. Well, you don't have to eat fish oil. I'll explain that to you in a, in a bit. Uh, we need to reduce omega-6s if they're excessive. And I won't go into that. We need to make monos the primary fat generally. And I won't go into that either. It's all in my book. So if you, if you want to know more about this, it's all there. We want to consider a DHA and EPA supplement, especially if we're pregnant or lactating, if we're, um, or we have a disorder that's linked to, to low DHA, which may be um, you know, schizophrenia or depression or something like that. So, and people that don't convert very efficiently may want to consider a supplement like people with diabetes or hypertension. Populations, for example, example Japanese people who, you know, through generations were high fish eaters, they may not have the enzyme that converts, enough of the enzyme that converts. So this is the interesting thing. Fish actually don't make DHA and EPA. They get it from microalgae, and so can we. We can actually get it from microalgae, and it's clean, and it's cultured. And there are over a dozen, a dozen different supplements, so it's, it's quite, it, and it's clean and it's renewable resource. We don't have to rape the oceans to get it. These are just some of the DHA EPA supplements available for vegans. They're all vegan. So, and, and I actually have this on my website as well if, if you want to take a peek. And there's some foods that are fortified with this stuff as well. I'm not going to skip over this. We just finished, this book is hot off the press. Everything that I've talked about and then some in, in much more detail is in Becoming Vegan Express Edition. This one will be coming out probably in about February, and this is going to be about six or 700 pages long. It's already written, we're just editing it now, and this one is just under 300. It's kind of like a, a easy read of, of this book. Uh, top 10 tips for optimal health on a vegan diet. Number one, make whole foods the foundation of your diet. Number two, 10 or more servings of veggies and fruits a day. Number three, legumes two or three times a day would be optimal. It could be soy milk, it could be tofu, it, and, and of course you want to include beans whenever you can. Uh, rely on whole foods for most of your fat. So nuts, seeds, avocados, and so on should be the primary source of fat rather than concentrated oils. Because you get nutrients with the calories. Okay, that's the deal. Go for whole grains, and I'm talking about intact grains, and the very best way to eat them is sprouted. So for example, for breakfast, I would have sprouted grains on my berries and fruit with some nuts and seeds and maybe a homemade dehydrated granola. But did you just you can sprout, you can sprout quinoa, you can sprout camel berries, spelt berries, you can sprout all of those things. And they're great. They're they're really good. Uh, and you want to vary your intake where grains are concerned according to your energy needs. So people that don't need a lot of calories don't need a lot of grains. People that need a lot of calories have a lot more room for them. Uh, minimize your use of processed foods like refined carbohydrates, starches, and sugars. Eat more raw foods. You know, you know, at least half in the summer, especially if your calories should be raw, as far as I'm concerned. I think there's some real advantages there. Make sure you're getting your vitamin D, your B12, and iodine, which a lot of people use salt that is sea salt non-iodized, and it can be an issue. So just, you know, you can get it from seaweed, you can get it from supplements as well. Minimize harmful chemical residues. So here we're talking about agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, all of that stuff, environmental contaminants, which move up the food chain, all the products of high temperature cooking, heterocyclic, heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, acrylamide, advanced glycation, end products, all of that stuff. Be very picky about your beverages. Most of what you drink should be water. And I want to end with a few more thoughts on um, becoming vegan, because becoming vegan is not about becoming perfect. 
Okay, it's just not, it's, that's not what it's about. What it's really about is recognizing that our choices have consequences for ourselves and beyond ourselves. You know, there's probably, to, to me, to be truly optimal for human health, our food choices must also be ecologically sustainable. We can't destroy the planet in the process of eating. And they've got to be ethically justifiable. And you know, there's no more powerful step that any one of us can take towards the preservation of this planet than becoming vegan. It takes one twentieth of the resources to feed a vegan that it does to feed a person eating a standard American diet. There was a study that was an award-winning study not too long ago that eating a hundred, they found that eating a hundred percent plant-based diet one day a week, just one day a week, reduces greenhouse gas emissions more than eating 100% local seven days a week. Okay? One day a week vegan does more to protect this planet than eating local 24-7. And most of all, for many of us in this room, a vegan diet promotes reverence for life. You know, animal life, uh, as most of us might imagine it back on the, the farm, a hundred years ago this was true. Forty percent of the North American population lived on a farm. By 2002 that figure was 1.5 percent. How do you raise enough animals when hardly anybody's farming to feed a huge population? Well, this is how. And this is the reality that people don't see when they buy a meat camouflaged in cellophane in the grocery store. We are so far removed from our food sources that we don't get where it's really coming from. And we've got to start to take responsibility for what we purchase. And we've got to recognize that, that these creatures that you see here are thinking, feeling beings. They're sent, sentient animals. That, Take pigs, for example. I think of pigs as being uh, a little more intelligent than dogs. That's what the research has shown. That they have the intelligence that is equivalent to a three to five year old child. They can play video games with their snout. They never make a mistake. I remember that one researcher said if the chimpanzees can learn this game as fast as the pigs, it would be a miracle. They're amazing. <laughs> They're very, very intelligent creatures. They live about 10 to 15 years in their natural uh, environment. We allow them to live six months of hell. Six months of hell. In a tiny little stall in a factory farm, the only time they ever see the light of day is when they get taken to the slaughterhouse. You know, it's just beyond belief. We slaughter, what is it, a thousand of them per hour in the yeah. slaughterhouse? Yeah. They say 10 to 30 percent of them end up being boiled alive. Yeah. You know, it just, to me, I don't get it. Most of the people I know are caring people, and how they don't see that this kind of treatment of these intelligent creatures is absolutely unjustifiable is beyond me. I don't get it. We need to, people need to understand where this stuff is coming from. And when you know the advantages of a vegan diet, what excuses do we have as human beings to, to do this to our fellow creatures? And I think it's just the time has really come that we take a stand and a very strong stand. Oh, these are, these are some of my books. And actually, in the new Becoming Vegan, the new Express edition, we go into the animal issues in, in quite a lot of detail. And, um, oh. That is everything. But oh, this was my, somebody asked me this question, what do you eat? And so this is kind of what I eat. I eat a huge bowl of cereal, sprouted grains, dehydrated granola, all my fruit, hemp seeds, fortified soy milk or homemade almond milk. Sometimes I have green juice. Lunch is usually something like soup, uh, raw vegetables with cashew cheese or something like that. Fresh fruit, a stuffed date. And dinner is usually a giant salad with cooked yams and pumpkin seeds and all sorts of beans or tofu or something like that. And my favorite dessert is banana ice cream that you put through the juicer, frozen fruit. 
So that's kind of what I do. But anyway, I um, I thank you very much for your attention, and um, I am I'm sorry I've used up all my time, but I will be outside signing books, and I will be here. I'm doing a, a lecture on the paleo diet. I want to equip you with everything you need to know about because you will have questions from friends and challenges and uh, I think this lecture you will find extremely informative. And uh, I am here the, the day and uh, tomorrow and if you see me and you have any questions, that's what I'm here for. Uh, so please feel free to ask. Thank you.